Hello, my name is Patrick Heron. Greetings to you all from the Emerald Isle. Nice to be with you again. And today I'd like to speak to you about the rapture of the church. Is there a rapture? Is there no rapture? Do we go to heaven or do we stay on earth to go through the great tribulation? And the reason I'm making this video is because so many people write to me because of my other videos telling me that no, there is no such thing as a rapture. All the saints stay on earth and go through the great tribulation and we must suffer in order to attain our righteousness. So what does the word of God say on this situation? And of course the uh, scripture that's always used referring to the rapture of the church or the gathering together as Paul calls it. He also calls it the departure of the church in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. But the main scripture referring to the rapture, what we call the rapture of the church, is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it's there I would like to start. And what I want to do here is allow the word of God to speak for itself. Let's see what it says. So this is a little study session, so you should open your Bibles, get your pen and paper out, get your highlighter out, and follow along. Mark these, and then go over them yourselves to see what they say. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <clears throat> and in verse 15 it says, According to the Lord's own word, we tell you what we we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage or comfort one another with these words. So here it tells us that the Lord himself is coming down from heaven. And he calls up the dead in Christ for, first. Then we which are alive and remain, which I believe will be us, will be caught up together and we're going to meet him in the clouds. And so will we ever be with the Lord. So let us take it from that. The Lord himself is coming down <clears throat> and we're meeting him in the air. And remember, it says, if you read on in the next passage, it says, Now, brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It says this is going to happen like a thief in the night. And a thief in the night, you know, he sneaks into your house when everybody's asleep. He steals all the precious, costly things, the gold, the jewels, the cash, and he sneaks out and nobody knows that this has happened until they wake up in the morning. And oh my gosh, the house has been robbed. He comes like a thief in the night, according to this. <clears throat> now, many, many people have written to me and said to me, no, you don't understand what this is speaking about at all. Because in Roman customs, in the Roman customs of the day, if a Roman general was re returning from some foreign campaign, all his uh, uh, officials would go outside the walls of the city and they would meet him outside the walls of the city and greet him out there and they, they would accompany him back into the city together. And they say that in the same way, what this is talking about is, is that God, Jesus Christ, is going to rise all the Christians up since the day of Pentecost. Then we which are alive remain will be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. We're all going to meet him up there in the clouds and then we are coming back down to earth with him. Just as the Romans used to do in, according to Roman customs uh, when, when the uh, Caesar and all these Roman people ruled the, the world at that time. Well let me tell you, it does not say anything in this scripture about us going up to meet him or coming back down with him. It, that's not what it says. And I'm not interested in what the Roman customs of the day were. Nor am I interested in the customs of uh, what was going on in Borneo or Outer Mongolia or Timbuktu. All I'm concerned about is, is what the Word of God says. And it says, the Lord is coming down. We're going up to meet him in the air. Now we'll go to um, John chapter 14. Because many people say that the Lord Jesus Christ never spoke about the rapture of the church. But I contend that he absolutely did. And this, again, is a very contentious piece here in John chapter 14. But let's see what it says. Jesus said in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. 
And if I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that where, that you also may be where I am. This is what he said. Now, again, many people have written to me and one man sent me two books that he wrote and he comes up with all sorts of um, peculiar interpretations of what this means. And to give you one interpretation, I'll tell you what one particular, in fact, a few people put this together and wrote to me and said, this is what this means. And they said, in my father's house means in my father's kingdom. So they changed the word house to kingdom straight away. There are many rooms means there are many places to live. I am going there to prepare a place for you means by my death and burial I will welcome you back into my life. And if I go and prepare a place for you I will come back and take you to be with me. That means even though you fled and did not first believe that I was alive in the kingdom that you all say may be where I am means uh, the kingdom when it comes to earth. In other words, in my father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. That's what Jesus said. But according to these guys, what he really said was, in my father's kingdom there are many places to live. By my death and burial I will welcome you back into my life, even though you fled and did not first believe that I was alive in the kingdom when it comes to earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what this shows me and shows you is, is that you can take this passage of scripture, you can allegorize it, you can spiritualize it, you can call it an idiom, and you can make it say anything you want it to say. Well, I have a, a unique interpretation for this particular piece of scripture that Jesus Christ uttered. And by the way, in order to know the context, when they say, they say that he wasn't talking about, about the context of this at all, uh, or rather that he wasn't talking about heaven at all, the context of this is, is in John chapter 13, verse 3, where Jesus say, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he knew he had come from God and he was returning, returning to God. That is the context. And then he says in verse 36, Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. So where was Jesus Christ going? Anyway, as I said, I have a unique interpretation of this particular scripture. And I'm going to give it to you now and see if it makes sense. In my father's house means in my father's house. There are many rooms. There are many rooms. So in his father's house there means in my father's house there are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you means he is going there to prepare a place for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be, may be where I am. And that means that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now I'm being a little bit facetious, ladies and gentlemen. In other words, Jesus Christ said what he meant and he meant what he said. So he talked about a house with many rooms. So is there a house with many rooms? Well, let's have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And I hope you're writing down these scriptures and following along. Then you can highlight them in your Bible and you can study them later on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So here, Paul is talking about an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So, this is the house Jesus Christ was talking about. <clears throat> if we hop up into Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about Abraham. And it says Abraham uh, was looking for a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. This is in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10. For he, Abraham, was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Paul tells us we have an eternal house in heaven. Now it says that there's an eternal city whose architect and builder is God. And then further down, in uh, Hebrews 11:16, it says, and again it's speaking about the great cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament, the patriarchs and prophets and men of God from those times, <clears throat> the great work they did for God. And it says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16. Instead they were looking forward to a better country. A heavenly one. 
Now, now we have a country. It speaks about a heavenly country. So we have a, 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 a house, a city, and now a country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So God has prepared a city for us. And by the way, why would he be preparing a city which is in heaven if nobody is going to it? And Jesus Christ said he was preparing a place for us in his Father's house which has many rooms. And this, according to this here, it's in the country. So heaven is a country, it's a city, and there's a big house there. Verse 4, we hop over to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. And this is very interesting because what this is going to tell us here is its name. It's going to give us the name of this city. Listen carefully. <coughs> Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, that's the name of the place, which is the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. So it's Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. This is all the same city they're talking about, and it's in the heavenly country. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assemble, assembly. In another version it says myriads upon myriads of angels. And angels are men, like Gabriel, Michael, etc., etc. But they're spirit men. Everywhere they appear in scripture, they're described as men. They wear clothes, they eat, they drink, they get dirty feet, uh, they've got big appetites. Thousands and thousands of angels in joy, joyful assembly. And listen to this. To the church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn. So you have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to upon thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. And to the church, the ecclesia of the firstborn. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the firstborn of God. We are born again by God's spirit. Once we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, we confess Him with, with our mouths, we believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we get born again of incorruptible seed, born from above. The seed of God, the Spirit of God is put into us, and that is our, our guarantee that we have eternal life. And it calls this city, it refers to it as the church of the firstborn. Well, why would this city which is in this heavenly country, which contains a huge house with many rooms in it where Jesus is preparing a place for us, why would it be called the church of the firstborn if the firstborn are not going there? The reason it's called that is because we are going there and one of the names for this city, Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, is the church of the firstborn, the ecclesia. Ecclesia means called out. We get the word ecclesiastes and ecclesiastical from it. It means called out. God has called us out of this crooked and perverse nation and put his spirit into us by his grace and by his mercy in this age of grace that we lived in, that we live in. We didn't earn it. We got it by grace, by divine favor. And that's why we are members of the body of Christ. He is the head. We are all members in particular of the body. We are the called out church of God. All the epistles are addressed to the called out. The church of Rome. The church, the called out at Ephesus. The church, the called out at Philippi, etc., etc. And this place, this city in heaven, in this heavenly country, which contains this house, is called the church of the firstborn. Let us go to uh, Philippines chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And in Philippians chapter 3 we read. And by the way, this is why it's called our blessed hope. Right? This, our blessed hope of the Christian, of the born again Christian, the church of God, is the second coming of Jesus Christ to take us out of here in what uh, many people call the rapture of the church. The gathering together, Paul calls it. Or the departure of the church. Right? This is our blessed hope. But hope biblically is different than hope in the natural world when we hope for something i think ah oh, i hope you know someday i might win the lotto or i hope someday you know uh, i might become rich and I, I hope someday that this will happen and it's a very nefarious nebulous sort of negative thing and might or it might happen but biblically hope is totally different biblically hope is something that you're absolutely going to have you just can't have it yet you're not getting it yet. It's an absolute hope. And this is what's called in Titus our blessed hope. Our blessed hope is that Jesus Christ is coming to rescue us from the wrath to come. This is our blessed hope. 
So I didn't want to touch on regular uh, scriptures regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ and us being saved from the wrath to come. Like for instance, Romans 5, 9 says we are saved from the wrath to come. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 says we are to wait for his son from heaven who has rescued us from the wrath to come. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says we are not appointed to wrath. I didn't really want to get into those. I wanted to have a look at other scriptures in the epistles which are specifically addressed to the church of God, to the saints at this time and this age, and see if there are other verses in there which uh, um, infer that we are going to heaven. And one of those is Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, and it says... I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. We are called heavenwards in in Christ Jesus. I mean, why are we being called heavenwards if we're not going there? And in Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is not on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, because that's where we come from. We are ambassadors, it says in Romans. We are ambassadors. An ambassador is somebody who goes to a foreign country and he represents the place he comes from, where we are ambassadors for Christ, you know? So that doesn't mean you walk around with an old cigarette in your fag in one hand and a beer in the other with dirty old jeans on you and a hump on your back. You're an ambassador. You now act like an ambassador. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. It says that in 1 Corinthians 15, that when he comes back, that this corruptible was put on incorruption. And that, our, you know, we're going to have a spiritual body like unto the spiritual body Jesus Christ had when he got up from the dead. When he could pass in and out through walls and then he could scoot up to heaven, fly up to heaven in the blinking of an eye. Where our bodies are going to be transformed and we're going to get a new spiritual body. And they will be like his glorious body. Now personally, uh, I'll be putting in for a new hip, a fresh head of hair and a more streamlined, streamlined physique. Uh, when I get my new spiritual body so I'll be able to uh, run around and do all sorts of things some of which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment Um, in Ephesians does it say anything in Ephesians about us going to heaven and Ephesians is the pinnacle of the seven church epistles addressed to the church of God right Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are specifically addressed to the Church of God. And Ephesians is the pinnacle of, of all those. It's an absolutely wonderful epistle where, you know, Christians should be spending a lot of their time in these epistles to, to glean out the truths in them. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Listen to that. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. We're already seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now again, this is like our hope. We're there, but we just can't have it yet. Now why would it be telling us in here that we are seated with him in the heavenly realms if we never go there? If our destiny is to stay on here, on earth, go through the tribulation, get chased down, get hunted, get beheaded, get burned, get tortured, our wives are ravished before our eyes, and our children are dashed to pieces against the tree in front of us, and they will have no mercy on us. Because that's what it says is going to happen to people who turn to God and Jesus Christ during that period. But it doesn't say that in here in the epistles. It says we are seated He has seated us with him in heavenly realms. Now, where do we go from here? Paul. What did Paul think about uh, getting to heaven? Well, he talks about it in 2 Timothy. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. Paul has something very interesting to say with regard to this. He says, and this was written uh, at the end of 2 Timothy, rather, where Paul was getting ready to die. He had said it by the end of 2 Timothy, I have run the race, I I have achieved all my goals, I have poured myself out for the Lord, I have done everything 
that I can do and now I'm ready to, to let go. Now I'm ready to fall asleep, to die and, and to let Timothy and other people get on to the, with the work. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Listen to that again. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. So Paul was expecting to go to the heavenly kingdom. So if he's expecting to go to the heavenly kingdom, then we should be expecting to go to the heavenly kingdom with him. And Paul was no mean dude. You know, Paul, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared to Paul at least twice in person. And he's the only one of the apostles that the Lord appeared to after, years after Pentecost and after he had ascended into heaven. He appeared to Paul at least twice. And he gave Paul the revelation of the mystery of the age of grace and, and, and the period that we are in now, the church, uh, the revelation regarding the, the mystery of the church of God, that we are all part of the one body of Christ, Jew and Gentile. Christ is the head and we are all members of the body. You know, so don't denigrate uh, uh, Paul because he was uh, an incredible man of God and just unbelievable character. And he has, says and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. So Paul is getting ready to go to the heavenly kingdom too. And of course being rescued, that being rescued ties in again with Galatians chapter 1 verse 3. Where it says grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Okay? Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. So Paul is talking about being rescued and going to the heavenly kingdom. And again, this says we're going to be rescued from the present evil age. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this present evil age is going to get a lot more eviler. Is that a word, eviler? It's going to get a lot more evil. You ain't seen nothing yet. All we're seeing at the moment are the labour pains as we come towards the, the, the consummation of the apocalypse, the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, the day of his cruel anger, the day of Jacob's tr trouble, which is all laid out in the book of Revelation. It's going to get a lot more uh, evil. Uh, but we are going to be rescued from this pre present evil edge. And, and again that ties in with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 where we're told to await for his son from heaven who has rescued us from the wrath to come. We're either rescued from it or we're not rescued from it. This is either the truth or a lie ladies and gentlemen. So and by the way it talks about this in the, the Old Testament too. There are several verses in Isaiah which speak and infer that we're going to be saved from the coming wrath. And one of those is in Isaiah 26. And in Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 20 it says, Go my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. And this is talking about the wrath of God that we are saved from. And please don't write to me and say that the wrath of God is different from the tribulation. And the tribulation is different from the great tribulation. And the great tribulation is different from the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is different from the day of Christ. And the day of Christ is different from the day of Jacob's trouble. And the day of Jacob's trouble is different from the day of his cruel anger and his cruel wrath and fierce, you know, anger. There are, there are many, 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 many names in the Old Testament and the New Testament all recite, re, 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 referring to the same period of time which Paul refers to as the wrath to come, right? And there are three different wraths in the, Bible, in the book of Revelation if you want to get pedantic. There's the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb and the wrath of the devil. So don't tell me where... It's all the same period of time and it's all going to begin with the gathering together the departure, the rapture of the church of God. Listen to Isaiah 26, 20 again. Go, go my people, enter your rooms. Now as an enter, it says enter your rooms because Jesus Christ said in my father's house there are many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you. He's up there putting a lot more rooms on this house of many, many rooms in the city of God, Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is also called the church of the firstborn and it's in a heavenly country. 
again, I, the, the more I read about this, the more I see heaven as a, a place like the earth perhaps. There's a, it's a country, it says in Hebrews. A heavenly country. And with a city in it. And with a house in it. With many rooms in it. So, shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath is passed by. That is referring to us being saved from the wrath to come. And there are a couple of other verses in Isaiah, by the way, which infer the same thing, referring to us being saved from the wrath to come. So I challenge you to read Isaiah and find those out. And then Romans chapter 11, verse 4, an interesting little verse. And in Romans chapter 11, uh, Paul is referring to Elijah. And he's talking about how in the days of Elijah, Elijah was left on his own and he, he complained to God, he prayed to God against all the Israelites. And he said, look at these Israelites, Lord, they've killed all your prophets, they've digged down all your altars, and now they want to kill me and I am the only one left. I am the only one left. Oh, woe is me. And what did God say to him? Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Paul says, and what was God's answer to him? God's answer was, quote, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That was his reply. And then Paul says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. That's what grace is, ladies and gentlemen. It's divine favour. By the grace of God, he chose you and he chose me and called us out called us out of this evil and perverse world and put us into the body of his dear son. Not by anything that he did, but, but by his grace. We are the remnant chosen by grace. This is a great mystery. It says in, in Corinthians 2 that if the, the devil and his princes had known about this mystery, they would never have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have a video on that called The Mystery and the Princes of Darkness. We are saved by grace. Nobody saw this period in between the death of Jesus Christ and his, and his glory, the second coming. This period was all hidden in God. And it was the age of grace, the time of the body of Christ. We are members in particular. And we are, uh, so too at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So you've got to remember when you're reading the word of God and rightly dividing it, you've you, don't confuse the Gospels with the Epistles. They're two separate times. And remember that Jesus Christ said on a few occasions, I am come but to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. You remember the time the Samaritan woman came to Jesus and she said, Lord, my daughter is sick, please heal her. And Jesus turned around and he said to her, it is not right to give the bread of the children to dogs. He called her a dog. He said the Samaritan woman was a dog. And he went on to say, I am come but to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. That's who Jesus Christ came to. He came along later on, years after Pentecost, and he chose Paul to give him the revelation of the mystery of God, which was hidden. And remember, Paul wasn't on his way to a Bible meeting, you know, uh, to, to pray to Jesus and to sing hymns to Jesus when God called him and when Jesus Christ appeared to him. He was on his way to Damascus to take Christians and throw them in jail. He said he was a murderer. He was involved in the murder of Stephen, the first martyr. So he was on the way down there with hate in his heart when God chose him. So God and Jesus Christ chose uh, Paul to be the apostle of the ministry of the mystery of grace. He was the exemplar because he, he, he chose the, the, the worst person he could find with hate in his heart who had already been involved in the murder of Stephen, one of the first m murderers. And in the same way, we are chosen by the same grace. So a lot of stuff that's in the Gospels is pertaining to the Gospels and to, to Israel and the Jews, the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. We are in a different administration now. And for those of you who don't like the word administration or, or dispensation, uh, it's the word oikonomia in the epistles, well then maybe you should complain to the Holy Spirit and tell him that you don't like that word oikonomia and you don't like the word administration or, or dispensation or, or, you, or the whole idea of these dispensations. You know, I didn't write the book, so complain to him. Or go and get your scissors and cut out that word out of the epistles. Because let me tell you, as I said, Jesus Christ appeared to Paul twice. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, I didn't get this 
uh, from man, nor, nor did man make, make it up, but I got it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So the epistles are as much the word of Jesus Christ as they are the words of Paul. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. We, ladies and gentlemen, are that remnant chosen by grace. The church of the firstborn, the ecclesia of God. Okay, I'd like now to turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, because in there it talks about the wedding feast of the Lamb. Because again, as I said, many people write to me and say, we're not going to heaven. You know, uh, the believers are staying on earth. We have to suffer through the tribulation. And you're a coward because you don't want to lay down your life and die for Jesus Christ. You know? Well, you know, I just recently read all the epistles of Paul uh, in the New Testament in, over the last few weeks. And it says in there several times that there's one sacrifice for all time. And that is Jesus Christ. You can't sacrifice anymore. Because that would be you doing your works. And if, there, if it's works then it's not grace. So I'd rather thank God for his grace. Which is his divine favour. And for his mercy. Which is his withholding of merited judgment. On me. You know. Who, who is a wretch and a sinner. And I think you should do the same thing. Thank God for his grace and for his mercy. And try and go out and win a soul for the Lord. And bring them to that same grace and mercy. And that same body of Christ. But in Revelation chapter 19. It talks about the marriage feast of the Lamb. And again this marriage ties in with the five wise virgins. And the five unwise virgins. And by the way I have a video on that. It's called the coming slaughter of Christians. You will enjoy that too. And in that, I rightly divide the word regarding to the five wise virgins. These were the wise virgins who had their lamps trimmed with oil and brought extra oil along. And they were ready to go out to meet their bridegroom. But the unwise virgins, they didn't have enough oil. And they were not ready. And then at midnight the call came. Go out, your bridegroom groom has come. And the wise virgins got up, they trimmed their lamps. They had enough oil to go out to meet their bridegroom. But the unwise virgin said, Oh, we don't have enough oil. Give us some of your oil. And the wise virgin said, No, we can't or else we won't have enough. You go off and buy your own oil. And then when you come back, you'll be okay. So they went off to, to buy their oil. But when they come back, it was too late. The, the door was shut. And the wise virgins had gone into the marriage feast of the Lamb. We are the bride of Christ. And I know many people think that the bride of Christ is referring to Israel. But if you get in and read Ephesians chapter 5 where it talks about marriage and how a man should treat his wife and love her and she should respect him, etc., etc. At the end of that passage in Ephesians 5 it says, I speak, this is a mystery, I speak referring Christ and the church. Because when they marry they become one flesh. And that is the marriage feast of the Lamb. And it's recorded in Revelation chapter 9. Now to get the context of this, we read verse 1. It says, After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting. So a great multitude in heaven. So where is this going on? In heaven. Not on earth. This is going on in heaven. Verse 7. Revelation 19, 7. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. For fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So, the wedding feast is coming. The bride is given fine linen, bright and clean to wear. And in verse 9 it says, Then the angel said to me, quote, Right, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. End quote. Absolutely are they blessed. <laughs> this is grace multiplied. And in verse 11 it says, jumping down to verse 11, Then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. And this is Jesus Christ on a white horse. And in verse 14 it says, The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Well, who do you think that is, ladies and gentlemen? The armies of he heaven following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. It says up there, 
Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear, to the bride of Christ. That is us. That is the church of the firstborn. We are going there. And we are going to get nice, white, bright linen clothes. Washed in parcel, perhaps. Or surf, maybe. Bright and clean. And we are going to be riding on white horses behind Jesus Christ. Well, I'm looking forward to that. As I said, when I get my new spiritual body, I'm going to get a new hip. Because I've got a... a I've got a very bad hip which causes me to limp and I've never been able to, you know, ride a horse or, or play football or do things since I was 15 years old. So I'm looking forward to riding horses. And it's interesting to me when I read this because we read earlier that they look for a heavenly country and a city that God has prepared for them. And in this city there's a house with many rooms in it. So there's a lot of white horses up there. Does that mean there's a lot of grass, a lot of fields, stables? The horses have to eat grass, eat hay. Somebody's got to muck out all that manure. We're going to have to learn how to ride these horses. We're going to get measured for our white linen, bright, uh, you know, bright white linen that we're going to be wearing. And we're going to be riding with Jesus Christ. And this is to Armageddon. All right? He's coming back on a white horse to fight at Armageddon. So, this is why it says in uh, chapter 1 of Revelation that when Jesus Christ comes back every eye will see him and them also which pierced him when he comes back on his white horse at Armageddon at the end of the tribulation when all the armies are gathered together to fight against, against, out, against the Lord on the white horse and it says at that time out of his mouth will go a two edged sword and he's going to destroy them with the brightness of his being it says, at that time, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. It says, at that time, they are going to invite all the birds of prey to gorge themselves on the blood of kings and generals and mighty men, horse riders, the flesh of all people, great and small. He said, at that time, when Jesus Christ comes back to fight against his enemies, he's going to grab hold of the beast and the false prophet, and they're going to be thrown alive into the burning lake of fire. And he's going to bind Satan and Satan is going to be thrown into, into the abyss where the beast and the false prophet are at present. And he's going to remain there for a thousand years. It says when Jesus Christ comes back at that time with his mighty ones from heaven, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, according to Zechariah 10, the Mount of Olives is going to split in two from east to west. And half the mountain is going to go towards the north and half towards the south. Fresh water is going to flow out from be not be be Neat that mountain when it splits in two and it's going to go into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea is going to become alive. At that time it says Jesus Christ is going to set up his earthly kingdom and he's going to rule with an iron scepter. At that time he's going to gather together all the sheep and the goats from the far corners of the world and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. When Jesus Christ comes back in power and great glory taking vengeance on those that know not God and on the enemies of God. Right? That's at the end of the tribulation, at the end of Armageddon, at the Battle of Armageddon. But now, jump back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it talks about the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Right? At that time, when he comes down, his feet don't hit the Mount of Olives, because we're going up to meet him in the, in the sky. He's not going to touch the ground. It's a different thing. At that time, it says he's going to come like a thief in the night. But at this, this time when he comes with his armies of heaven and his mighty ones from heaven on a white earth, it says every eye will see him and those also which pierced him, which are the, all the devils, Satan and all his princes. They're all going to see him. But when he comes back in 1 Thessalonians 4 at the rapture, it says he's coming like a thief in the night. He sneaks in, takes all the precious costly stuff, which is us, the firstborn of God, the remnant chosen by grace. His sons and his daughters who have chosen to love him by their own free will and accepted him as, our, as his personal Lord and Saviour. The Bride of Christ. You know, somebody wrote to me recently and they said, Oh yeah, uh, Jesus says, I choose you to be my, my, my bride, but first of all I'm going to beat the lard out of you for several years and then I'm going to come and marry you later on. What sort of a bride is that? That will make him a wife beater. Of course he's not going to do that. When he comes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
we're gone, the dead in Christ will rise first, we which are arrived from remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. He doesn't separate the sheep from the goats at that time. He does not set up his earthly kingdom. Listen to what it doesn't say in First Thessalonians chapter 4. It says the Lord himself is coming. It doesn't say there's a whole bunch of mighty ones coming with him or armies of heaven coming with him. He's not going to land on the earth. We're going up to meet him and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to heaven. We're the armies of heaven. We're going to the marriage supper in heaven. That is why heaven is called not only Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. It's also called the church of the firstborn. Because the church, the called out firstborn sons and daughters of God are going there to that marriage supper. And I'd like to warn you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who choose not to adhere to these truths, there is a very, very grave warning in the word of God regarding people who deviate from the truths of the rightly divided word of God with regard to this doctrine. And it says in Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than we have preached, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Twice it says, people that teach another gospel is accursed. That is not, not a very nice thing to do. And I know that many of the Christians that say, we're going through the tribulation. There is no rapture. We're not going to heaven. We're all going to shoot up in the air, meet him, and then we're all coming down back down here with him. Just like the Roman generals used to do. No, 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 no. You may be sincere, but sincerity is no guarantee for the truth. All I am expounding to you right here now are some very simple, different, different scriptures, I believe, that show unequivocally and without any doubt that the, we are indeed saved from the wrath to come. We're either saved from it or we're not saved from it. It's a different group of people who are going to go through that time so anybody teaching any other gospel it says in here let him be accursed and I would not want that curse on my life and I don't think you should should either so um, I'd like to thank you for listening to this sharing uh, on rapture or no rapture well there def definitely is a rapture and you know people get all bent out of shape about the word rapture you know it's taken from the from the Latin from the Vulgate which was translated in 400 uh, AD from Greek into Latin and comes from rapero which means to snatch out to, to be caught up harpazo is the word in Greek which means to be caught away so if you enjoy this teaching what I'd like you to do is you can subscribe to my YouTube you can put this on Facebook you can get the link and send it to your friends uh, you can put it on your blogs you can help me spread the word of God by uh, subscribing and by sharing this on your Facebook or you know wherever else you can do. And by the way, I'd like to let you know that if you'd li like to delve deeper into this, I do have four books um, on my website that I've written. I've got three audio books for those of you who like, like to listen to audio books. And um, <clears throat> three of my books are also as e-books. And you can get them on my website, which is www.neph.ie. And of course, uh, my two latest ones are the Nephilim and the Pyramid of the Apocalypse, which is a fantastic book for sharing with people uh, in order to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's written for secular people, you know, people that are non-Christians as well as Christians. And the follow-up to that is Return of the Antichrist and the New World Order. Um, again, you can find all the links to these on my website. And I have several other videos. Uh, which will bless you very, very much, I believe. Um, and I want to thank you for listening. And God bless you. And I will speak to you again soon. God bless. Bye-bye.